Germany, France and several other European Union countries say they are resuming AstraZeneca vaccination. Regulators, politicians and AstraZeneca aren't just taking decisions about science, they're taking decisions about information. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert and you're at the Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. This week, we're devoting the entire broadcast to COVID-19 and the global vaccination story, beginning with misinformation and flawed messaging that are among the factors in Europe's dangerously slow rollout of the vaccine. This is CBN Newswatch. In the U.S., they're using Christian broadcasters, sports stars, and a country music legend to convince Americans that vaccination is in their best interest. France is where lab vaccines were invented. So how did the French grow so skeptical, so reluctant to take this one? And if conspiracy theories are your thing, why stop at COVID-19? No, I'm not, not brainwashed by the coat industry, thank you. Have you ever thought about your winter coat and if you're being played by a billion dollar industry? Since the early days of the COVID-19 outbreak, scientists have said the way out of this pandemic is through vaccinations. Vaccines have since been developed, tested, manufactured and delivered in record time. The chances of it all working may hinge on the issue of trust. The more people who believe in the medical science and there are vaccine skeptics out there, the better the chances. So the role of the messengers, including politicians, pharmaceutical companies, as well as the news media, is central. The European Union's vaccine rollout is an example of how things can go wrong. Less than 12% of the EU's adult population has had the jab. That's far less than the UK or the US. And communications and credibility are two areas that AstraZeneca, the company providing the bulk of the EU's doses, has come up short. Some of the political rhetoric hasn't helped either, and the news media have been left to sort through mixed messaging on a quite complex story. Our starting point this week is the EU's vaccination drive. The COVID vaccination drive is really unprecedented. We've never developed any vaccines this quickly. The vice president is getting the shot. Everything happens at a much faster pace. It's the science, it's the re regulation, it's also the communication. Le pharmacien lui administre une première dose. Everything is, is kind of on warp speed. What's also unprecedented is the sheer intensity of coverage. We have more intense media coverage than ever before, 24-7 news. A shot in the arm for the Prime Minister. News alerts, social media. The appetite for that information is higher than ever before. CDC just issued a stark warning. Coronavirus. From the outset, this pandemic has underlined the importance and sometimes exposed the shortcomings of societal institutions, governments, medical science, and the news media. Tonight, the focus is on the World Health Organization. People initially did not know what to make of the virus, the threat, the precautions required. Now they are trying to sort through the science to determine the value of the various vaccines on offer. Speed is of the essence in this process, and that is a core problem in the communicating of this story. In the pre-COVID days when we evaluated a vaccine, uh, we really wouldn't lay out that data to the media until the results were fully published and evaluated and vetted by multiple different scientific agencies. And then the media would be able to report on it. In the era of COVID, the media is on um, pace with the scientific information. Early results from a late stage clinical vaccine trial from Pfizer. So even as we're beginning to evaluate the data and understand what it means, the media is reporting on it. There's a lot of things that we do not know and so the communication of uncertainty becomes incredibly important. Now, that's something that science journalists on the whole are usually accustomed to. Um, it's very different in political journalism, for instance. And even if journalists had done you know, a perfect job, there would still be a lot of uncertainty about the AstraZeneca vaccine because the first trials that we got on this particular vaccine just raised a lot of questions. AstraZeneca is an Anglo-Swedish pharmaceutical company. Its vaccine was produced in conjunction with Oxford University, and the initial reports were promising. 
It is relatively cheap to produce and far easier to store than the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine developed in Germany or the Moderna vaccine, which came out of the US. Those were among the reasons the EU went all in on AstraZeneca. But the company has been scrutinized for the way it's conducted its clinical trials and communicated the results. That recent data from the drug makers vaccine trials has raised questions in the scientific community. In one case, its researchers mistakenly trialed using just half a dose and then delivered a second shot to make up for it. Rather than dismissing those results, the company simply blended them with another single dose trial it had conducted and stuck those numbers into a press release. So that caused some questions uh, in the public as to how are you conducting your trials and how are you going to interpret that data. They ended up then rolling out sort of an efficacy number of around 70% where they tried to average those numbers together and then got immediate backlash both from the scientific community as well as others that, well, you can't really analyze your data that way. So that sort of put them in the spotlight even further. And it's not just AstraZeneca, you know, all the companies that I think are Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, it's a similar level of things. I know there's a big business motive for, you know, keeping some things more confidential, but we are in this unprecedented state and a bit more transparency, the effect that has on, on, on public behavior and public trust, I think that would have helped us all in the long run. You then have journalists starting to feel like they are being played by these companies. And you can understand that people then are very hesitant and look very critically at these press releases, as they should. So I lay a lot of blame at the feet of these companies for not doing that. AstraZeneca can point to a story in a German financial paper as an example of questionable journalism with potentially serious consequences for the public's trust in its vaccine. In late January, Handelsblatt published an article quoting an official from the country's health ministry, saying that when administered to the elderly, the AstraZeneca vaccine offered only negligible protection. It was one quote from an anonymous source. Both the company and the government issued immediate categorical denials. But the story was out there. The damage to the vaccine's reputation was being done. It would have been huge news if, 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 um, um, if this was correct. So everybody then started speculating what this data was, and nobody could answer this, including Handelsblatt, because just some source had told them. Wie aus Regierungskreisen durchsickert, soll der Impfstoff bei über 65-Jährigen nur eine Effektivität von unter 10 Prozent haben. Then there were denials by AstraZeneca. Then there was speculation from a British news outlet that they just actually confused some numbers, it, uh, and, and 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 so this whole thing escalated. And then you had an interview with Angela Merkel, um, I think done by Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, and she was asked, so are you going to get this vaccine to make people feel better about it? And she's 66, so she said she's not actually eligible for that vaccine. And then you can go to the UK and you can see papers saying Angela Merkel refuses AstraZeneca jab. So this is where really it becomes political journalism, but that's not to say that journalism in general, you know, is to blame for the crisis of confidence in the AstraZeneca vaccine. I think the company itself has done a lot uh, to, to foster that, that problem. Skepticism over vaccinations was surfacing in Europe well before AstraZeneca's missteps. Between that pre-existing social condition, vaccine hesitancy, and the fact that the EU was relatively slow to order its vaccines, followed by AstraZeneca's failure to deliver as many doses as it promised, only 11% of European adults have received their first dose, compared to 33% in the US, 55% in the UK. In comparing the various vaccines, media outlets usually focus on efficacy rates, how adept the different vaccines are at preventing infection. More than 90 percent effective each. The numbers range from around 70 percent for AstraZeneca to more than 90 percent for Pfizer and Moderna. But those figures are misleading because the trials were conducted in different places at different times with differing benchmarks of success. Moreover, some experts contend the focus on the varying efficacy rates is a distraction. Far more important is how effective all the vaccines are at saving your life in the event that the virus beats the odds 
gets past the vaccine and manages to infect you. In the COVID-19 pandemic, we've kind of fallen prey to the numbers and infographics. And so the same thing happens when we compare the vaccines. So we compare this primary efficacy, but then there are many other things to have in mind. Side effects, how these vaccines uh, can um, inhibit severe disease. When you actually now compare all the vaccines at that level, how effective are they in protecting against hospitalization and death? They're all pretty much equal, 100%, which is phenomenal in terms of protecting us from the most devastating effects of the disease. That is the good news. The challenge in the absolute deluge of reporting around the vaccine story is seeing that bigger picture and keeping it in mind. The hunger for information is understandable, but take it from the experts. Sometimes less can be more. And that applies to the COVID-19 vaccine story, the daily dose of news and information that we have grown so dependent upon. We've been in a non-stop kind of developing news cycle for over a year, and uh, it's, it's very exhausting for the journalists, but it's also exhausting for the, for the news consumers. The most important thing for the news consumer is to try to get off this addiction to COVID-19 news every day or many times a day. I like weekly magazines uh, so to, to, to give me an overview of what has happened so that I can you know, make sense of this combination of small developments that, that are you know, happening 24 hours a day, every day for a whole year. When you're consuming this news, you do need to be patient. Everybody has this need to feel like they're up to date and like they're getting the breaking news. But in this particular pandemic, with things moving so fast, there's a kind of fog of war about it. And it actually really, you know, is much better to get the information maybe a day later, maybe two days later. But then these things become much clearer. Vaccine skepticism isn't just limited to Europe. Convincing citizens to get their shots has been a challenge for politicians all over the world. And the government in the U.S. seems to think that the answer isn't just in the messaging, it's also in the messengers. Johanna Hoos has been following this story. Joe, who specifically is the White House targeting here? Conservatives, Richard, and particularly men. Recent polls have indicated that of that group, roughly 50% are actually unwilling to get vaccinated. A lot of those people voted for Trump and they actually still refuse to accept that he lost the election, which is why the White House seems to think that perhaps President Biden isn't the best man for the job when it comes to convincing these people to change their minds. Sure, but where does that leave the White House? Relying on Fox News, Newsmax, OAN, because that's a hostile crowd. How about uh, the Christian Broadcasting Network or CBN? Now, it's extremely popular with American evangelicals, most of whom actually voted Republican, despite the fact that Trump has been known to uh, break a commandment or two. Now, CBN will be airing ads that have been produced to uh, convince its viewers to get their jabs. And the Biden administration is also trying to uh, involve the American Farm Bureau Federation in this campaign, since vaccine skepticism is extremely rife in rural America. So rural areas, white voters, the South, those are the target audiences, and they're using various ways to get to those people. Yes, and sports is actually a very big part of that. So NASCAR, which is the stock car racing circuit, is huge with uh, the people you just described, white, Southern, mostly Republican voters. NASCAR has confirmed that it is working with the White House, putting some of its drivers forward to get the word out, even turning some of its racetracks into vaccination centers. Now, the campaign also includes videos featuring athletes from some of the major sports leagues, including the NFL, the NBA, some baseball players, all in an effort to reach those Republican voters. And also part of that effort, by the way, is a soundtrack to these ads, which is a new recording by country music star Willie Nelson. Nothing like a little country music to get the word out down south. That's the approach. Okay, thanks, Joe. And now to a vaccine story that would have Louis Pasteur rolling over in his grave. Pasteur was the first laboratory scientist to produce a vaccine for diseases like anthrax and rabies. He was from France, where roughly a third of citizens now say they will refuse to be vaccinated for COVID-19. Why would France, of all places, have among the highest vaccine hesitancy rates in the world? It was showing symptoms well before this pandemic and a cocktail of conspiracy theories, a growing distrust of elites, 
political and medical, has exacerbated that. One of the online elements in the mix is a documentary that went viral, alleging that this pandemic is all one big plot. Influencers, some of whom traffic in conspiracies, are doing their thing on social media. The Macron government, big tech, and mainstream news outlets are all trying to bring the French back around, knowing that their prospects of defeating this virus may well be riding on it. The Listening Post's Daniel Touré now on the COVID conspiracy theories and vaccine skepticism plaguing France. November 2020, France's second lockdown. Outside, police patrol the stark streets. Indoors, TV pundits discuss the news just in of a possible way out, a vaccine that is proving highly effective against the virus. But in many homes, people are getting a very different message. They're watching Hold Up, a big-budget documentary that presents the pandemic as a plot by global elites to control the world's population, with the vaccine as their weapon of choice. Dans 10 ans ou dans 20 ans, est-ce que vous pourrez regarder vos enfants dans les yeux et leur dire que vous ne saviez pas C'est totalement différent. Il y a eu. It's totally different from most conspiratorial documentaries that are amateurish and make you skeptical from the get-go. Hold Up raised a lot of money through crowdfunding, so it's extremely well produced, with beautiful footage, a nice soundtrack, and interviews that are well shot, and that gives it a certain air of seriousness. It uses all the codes of investigative TV journalism. So on the one hand, it features a lot of experts, including two Nobel Prize winners. But in reality, those journalistic codes are completely subverted. Some of the experts are not who they're made out to be, and it's full of falsehoods. For instance, it tries to show that the first lockdown made people sicker and created more deaths. The virus has donc particularly sévi du 15 mars au 15 avril, période où nous étions tous confinés. We know very well that there's a delay between when people fall ill and when they die, and a couple of weeks after the lockdown, there were hardly any more COVID deaths. So it's a pretty blatant manipulation. We're told that the World Health Organization is against wearing masks, which is completely untrue. The film also suggests, and I say suggests because it never states anything frankly, that the Pasteur Institute created the virus from scratch, without offering any proof whatsoever. For the professor, no doubt. The virus is bien sorti de l'Institut Pasteur avant d'être envoyé à Yuan ou ailleurs. It's cleverly done because it presents a mountain of arguments and information that leaves you disoriented. At the end of it, the viewer might think, okay, well, even if not everything is true, there's no smoke without fire, so at least some of it must be true. Et sans doute que ce qu'il raconte, c'est pas totalement faux non plus. The film was quickly condemned by the head of President Macron's party. The Pasteur Institute, named after the scientist behind the first ever vaccine, accused the producers of defamation. But Hold Up had already made its mark. Despite Vimeo's decision to delete it the day after its release, the documentary racked up 3 million views in its first week, jumping from platform to platform faster than anyone could remove it. The audience that Hold Up found reflects a striking reality in French society. Just how prone citizens are to believe in conspiracy theories around the virus, and how many of them are anti-vaccine. In December, a month after the film came out, a survey concluded that only 40% of French people plan to get vaccinated. That's one of the lowest levels in the world. The land where Louis Pasteur once invented vaccination has become a hotbed of vaccine skepticism. These conspiracy theories have radically changed the way French people look at official information about COVID-19. And the real risk is that they discourage people from getting vaccinated. If half of the population refuses the vaccine, the vaccination drive will not be effective and it won't put an end to this pandemic. Not all the suspicions around vaccines come from conspiracy theories. France's recent history of health failings has also played its part. Flawed vaccination campaigns in the 1990s and 2000s wasted vast sums of taxpayer money, fueling speculation that Big Pharma and the French state were in collusion. 
Those suspicions were reinforced a decade ago by reports that an anti-diabetes drug had killed hundreds before regulators took it off the shelves. And when the pandemic hit this time last year, French officials made things even worse. L'usage du masque en population générale n'est pas recommandé et n'est pas utile. Le port du masque sera rendu obligatoire dans tous les transports. Mais... Mixed messaging par excellence. Puzzled citizens confined to their homes increasingly looked for alternative sources of information and soon found them. Il y avait des YouTubers, alors par exemple... There were YouTubers, for example, Thierry Casanova and Jean-Jacques Crevecoeur. He gained huge audiences during the pandemic. Pendant toute la pandémie. Alors, écoutez bien ce que je vous dis. Quand on vous parlera d'un vaccin contre le coronavirus, ce ne sera pas un vaccin. Ce sera tout autre chose. They say the vaccines are dangerous and that it would be better to rely on natural methods to cure ourselves, like eating raw vegetables. And then there's another personality, Silvano Trotta. Another personality, c'est Silvano Trotta. For the past few years, Silvano Trotta has mostly been interested in flying saucers and aliens, and he didn't have much of a following on his YouTube channel. Then comes the pandemic. He starts saying that COVID is an invention, that Bill Gates is behind it all, and suddenly he starts having incredible success. This is a mind control device. Voilà. En fait, c'est un moyen. It's hard to measure how influential all these characters are, but when we look at how many followers they have, Silvano Trotter has around 200,000 YouTube subscribers. Thierry Casasnovas has half a million. It's really quite shocking. What's surprising is that this proliferation of conspiracy theories happened pretty much without anyone noticing. What we now know is that throughout the first lockdown, a lot of groups popped up on social media. Facebook pages, WhatsApp groups, where anti-mask messages and rumors of a conspiracy by Big Pharma spread dramatically. And this is how these theories penetrated French society as a whole. It is no longer a narrow segment of the population that is exposed to them. No, now they are reaching everyone. That means French celebrities too. From A-list actors like Juliette Pinoche to Kim Glow, a reality TV star with more than a million followers on Instagram. Big tech firms have intervened. YouTube has followed Vimeo's deletion of Hold Up, removing a number of French accounts for spreading false information about the virus. Ça n'a rien d'un documentaire, mais alors absolument rien, aucun travail contradictoire, des opinions assénées, non questionnées, des extraits de vidéos et de discours non contextualisés, bref. Media outlets and politicians are also part of the fight back, though they come with even more baggage. Distrust in those institutions, the kind that fueled the Yellow Vest protest movement in 2018, is a root cause of the problem. La pandémie est arrivée en France. The pandemic arrived in France at a very particular time, a time of massive distrust among the population towards our institutions. The conditions were already in place for people to say, we don't believe you, so there's no point in telling us to wear masks, to get vaccinated and so on. We no longer have faith in you, and we no longer have faith in our experts. That lack of faith has helped COVID conspiracy theories move from the margins to the mainstream. On the vaccine, there are signs of a shift. As citizens see friends and relatives get the jab without ill effects, trust is on the rise, but it's still short of the level that an effective vaccination drive will need. France may have to combat one epidemic of misinformation in order to defeat the other. The search for an antidote goes on. And finally, you don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to be a vaccine skeptic, but it certainly helps. And if you've ever tried to talk some sense into a person prone to COVID conspiracies, you'll have detected a pattern. It starts with denial of the science, some second guessing of medical practices, suspicion of political figures, a false equivalence or two, all leading to a swirl of certainty, which is difficult to cure. As online comics Peter Scatini and Walter Masterson pointed out in this next video, that formula can be applied to just about anything. And that's something that you people, sheeple, just might want to consider the next time you put on your winter coat. 
We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post. Dude, it's like 30 degrees. Don't you want to put on a jacket? No, I'm not, not brainwashed by the coat industry. Thank you. The, the coat industry? Aren't you worried about getting hypothermia? You know what? If you look at the statistics for hypothermia, uh, most of those people were wearing coats. And so that, that's reason to not layer up when it's literally been snowing all day. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I, just, I feel like if you did your own research, you'd sort of know this. What? But, you know, I mean, the coat industry is like a billion dollar industry. All right? It's just all, it's all a scam. All right? It's just they just want to get you to buy more coats. Well, that's why they, you know... But because coats work. You're just, okay, sheeple. I mean, it's sort of, do your own research on this, and then we can have, like, an actual conversation about it. But, but what if you get sick? What if I get, I mean, do I look sick? Kind of.